You tend to think that a great vocal blend is going to come from people with similar voices, but it's not the case. And I found that but with Pied Pumpkin and with UHF and with BTU, our voices are very different, but the blend is something so unique and so special. That's Sherry Ulrich of Bowen Island. On this edition of Today in BC, we'll chat with the singer-songwriter who's been performing in British Columbia since the early 1970s. From the latest community news to informative, entertaining reads for travelers and the cannabis curious, just visit your local Black Press Media community newspaper website to sign up today. Sherry, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. You're originally from California. So what was it like growing up in San Rafael in the 60s? And was music a big part of your childhood? Absolutely, it was a big part of my childhood, as it was everyone's in that era. But certainly to be growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area was pretty heady. I mean, of course, I didn't have the perspective on it that I have now, but that time in music was so transformational. It went from sort of light pop to really writing about our society and what was going on in our times and so much creativity and probably with the enhancement of drugs (laughs) and various (laughs) other things. And, you know, the freedom of that generation to be so much more explorative than previous generations. I was still a teenager at that time. I saw the Beatles a couple of times. I I saw all the bands of that day. I, I had no concept that I was going to be a musician, but what I was taking in from the culture was so powerful and definitely left a lifelong impression on me. Were there musicians at home? Not really. My mother and father were both musical. They both had an ear, and we had a piano, and my my siblings were the ones who got lessons. For some reason, I didn't. I would go listen to my sister's piano lessons, and then after they were over, I'd look at the notes on the page that she was reading, and my ear would remember what was being played. So I kind of taught myself to read in that way. So then you moved from California to British Columbia in 1970 and started in on the coffee house circuit. Uh, I was on a college campus and very active in the peace movement with friends being drafted and it was a time to definitely make your, your voice heard. And Kent State happened where students were shot by the National Guard and I was living at home but my mother was off in Europe traveling and So I just felt like, okay, I want to go now. I'm going to go to Canada where it's different. I had a friend in Canada to visit. And my concept, of course, I've told this story in concert because it's so ludicrous. My idea of Canada was that it was just wilderness and I was going to move here to Homestead. (laughs) So that's what I packed up the car with, everything I might need to either build a teepee or a log cabin. I hadn't decided which. Not all the wood, but (laughs) the books on how to do it. And uh, drove into Vancouver. It was certainly felt like what I was looking for. Something kinder, gentler, a little less insane. And uh, that's what I found, and that's what it remains to be from my perspective. The early days in the coffee house circuit, who were your musical influences? Yeah, so I started, uh, I lived on a commune for a while and started playing conga drum with a guitar player who lived there. We, we played at the Nam restaurant in Vancouver on the weekends. Uh, so that was the very early 70s. And then I started meeting musicians and then I started to feel like this was my path. So the people I met early on were Joe Mock and Rick Van Krugel, Rick Scott, and of course Joe Mock and Rick Scott became the Pied Pumpkin. So that was really my first trio, first of several trios (laughs) with two wonderful men. The main coffee house we played in Vancouver was the Classical Joint, but we were more community halls and, well, actually just community halls. Yeah, that was my start as, as a performer and as a musician. So Pied Pumpkin was popular, I guess, in Vancouver and in the Kootenays? Kootenays was the real hotbed for it. I mean, eventually we were traveling across the country, but definitely, yeah, the Kootenays, BC. 
And you had a pretty long run and even came back for a reunion album and tour? Yeah, we kept reuniting over the years, never knowing if that was really going to be the last show or the last of it. It feels we didn't think that the last time we played. Maybe that was it. It's hard to say. But that music, it was so unique and so enduring and so spirited and made people so happy that it's timeless and we could do it forever. A guest of our podcast uh, recently was Valdi, and I know you were a member of the hometown band for a few years. And that four or five year stretch between Pied Pumpkin and hometown band was, by industry standards, a very busy and very rewarding stretch for you. And surprisingly, both of those groups were only together for two to three years. They seemed like that was a, an eternal chapter because they packed so much in. But I was still with the Pied Pumpkin when I went on tour with Valdi as the hometown band, as one of his side musicians. And at the end of that tour, that first tour with Valdi, we decided to be a band as a separate entity. I had no intention of leaving the Pied Pumpkin. But the manager of Valdi and then subsequently the hometown band insisted that I could not do both. Of course, now I juggle three, four groups at a time. And, and the, the idea that there would ever be a time when I would let someone tell me that yeah. is so ludicrous. So it was heartbreaking for me. Uh, of all the decisions I've ever made in my life, leaving the Pied Pumpkin so I could play with the hometown band was the most torturous and hellish but it was too compelling. Um, Valdi was playing to 3,000-seat theaters, two shows a night all across the country. I was singing Fear of Flying every night to his audiences, and that's how I became known in Canada, really. So it, it was quite pivotal in that regard for me as an artist when I eventually started writing. And nominated for Junos about that time as well. Yes, the band won a Juno, and then when I went solo after the band, I was nominated several times and then won one. You play a number of stringed instruments, including guitar and violin. Piano is in there. You've got the flute, I've heard in a few tunes. And your daughter, Julia, who started with you on stage at about age 12, is also a multi-instrumentalist. So shall we assume the knack of playing various instruments just kind of comes naturally, and you've passed that along as well? Yes, and I think really it all stems from just having a, a really good ear. I'm not particularly skilled on any of them, quite frankly. Uh, I'm not somebody who would sheds and practices as much as I know that I should, but I am well served by my ear, as is Julia, and I always say that when she was born, of course, you're supposed to wish for all the fingers and toes and all of those basic things. But I secretly couldn't wait to find out if she had a good ear <laughs> because it's such a powerful, it's everything. And she, of course, toured with me from the time she was an infant. So she was always around music. I mean, in utero, she was around music. I was recording with UHF when I was very pregnant with her, so with a mandolin right next to her head. <laughs> so I'm sure that that has all influenced her. So it was a natural thing. She's got a big science brain, so being a musician was not quite challenging enough for her. <laughs> I don't know whether to take that as an insult, but uh, so she went into engineering, got her master's in music and sound recording at McGill. So she's she plays with her dad, who's also a fantastic songwriter, and she plays with me, but she's not interested in being a musician as her life's work. She's an engineer. Must make it tough packing a vehicle with all those instruments, except for the piano, obviously, but I guess... Oh, no, I bring the piano, too. Yeah. It's, or at least it's, a keyboard. It's Yeah, it's a curse, for sure, and I do try and keep my bandmates from teasing me about how much stuff I carry, because it just comes with a lot of... and a lot of instrument changing during shows, And but, oh, I love it so much. And you've had those instruments a long time. I always figure there's two types of musicians. One who, you know, is always trading up or buying up to the latest and greatest and the other who settles in with, you know, a 1956 Gresh or whatever it is yeah, and yeah. keeps it until they can't play anymore. Until it's stolen. <laughs> yeah. so, so you're the latter. 
Yes, I'm definitely the latter. My very first violin was purchased by a great aunt when I won a scholarship in grade seven for $50. <laughs> she uh, decided she should buy me a violin, and I had that until I was on my way to the very first hometown band show, and it was stolen out of the car while I waited for the drummer to come out. The violin that I had after that is the violin that I've had until the, a couple of years ago when I had a five-string custom made for myself. But yes, I'm definitely very true to my instruments, and most of my cohorts are constantly, as you say, trading up. One thing I, I find remarkable about listening to songs from your time with the hometown band to now, for instance, is that your voice is as clear and as strong as it was in the 70s. And do you do anything special? No, I don't do a damn thing. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> I don't drink, so I don't need to, to cut that out. And I know that I should warm up. What I have lost is that my high register for full voice, like you would use more in a rock genre. When I listen to stuff from the 70s and early 80s, I think, wow, I was singing so much higher in full voice. I still have a, a good falsetto. Well, speaking of high registers, your sound works pretty well with others that have high registers like Bill Henderson. Roy mm -hmm. Forbes. Yeah. So tell us about your time with uh, the trio UHF. I find that most of the great collaborations I've had, all of the ones that have been enduring, have been ones that started as a one-off, and then they were so enjoyable that we just kept doing it. So that was almost 30 years ago. 1989 is when we did a show together, and then we just kept performing together because it, it was the blend of our voices. Like, you tend to think that a great vocal blend is going to come from people with similar voices, but it's not the case. And I found that but with Pied Pumpkin and with UHF and with BTU. Our voices are very different, but the blend is just something so unique and so special. When Today in BC returns... Sherry Ulrich talks about her current album, songwriting, and finding Mike McGee. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. We're back with Sherry Ulrich of Bowen Island, who plays everything with strings and, as the saying goes, sings like a bird and has a knack for attracting great musical partners. Sherry, you've had a long musical association with Barney Bentall and Tom Taylor. Yeah, that's been 12 years, I guess, now. And again, we just got together to do one sort of song circle event on Bowen Island and just loved it so much. And, you know, over the years, we've realized that we love the music and we love one another's songs. And it's one of the great things about a trio of solo artists is you get to be a musician and a support person two-thirds of the time so that you're supporting the song of someone whose work you love and who you love as a person. So along with the music has grown this wonderful brother-sisterhood between us that is just so precious to us. We love it so much. We don't get to play together as often as we'd like. And you're back on the road. Yes, finally. Not fully, but yes, it's been fantastic. Your current album was released uh, shortly before the pandemic, and many of the videos associated with the tunes were recorded at your home on Bowen Island, and there's amazing vistas and water and whatnot in the background. Other artists in other locations joined in via technology, Zoom and whatnot. How did you feel about all that process? Well, I was very grateful that we had a way to make music together and to access our audience, and grateful that that also meant a wider audience, that somebody who doesn't live in Parksville, who might live in Ontario or Japan or wherever, that they can have access to the music. That was exciting and fun. I never got completely comfortable with it because it's just so foreign to not be in the room with the people who are receiving the music. Even if I see them on screen, it's just odd. But I did enough of it to know that I was really looking forward to being able to not 
do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think it's going to be a part of our palette from here on out because it is a different medium. It accesses an audience that's different. That's all good. I'm also interested in Sherry, the songwriter. Have you always written, and what's the process? <laughs> There's a lot of avoidance in the process. I have not always written. I was not one of those tortured teens who wrote poetry, and that evolved into songwriting. I probably t- wanted to and tried to for four or five years before I finally managed to write a song, and that first song was on the second hometown band album because the record company rejected the album. They said, we don't hear a hit. So I thought, I've got to write something that they are going to put out as a single. So my first song I wrote on Dulcimer, and it was called Feel Good, and it was successful. So that was the encouragement I needed, that my instincts that were struggling to write a song for all those years were correct and that I should pursue it. But I am still a deadline writer. I'm still someone who needs someone to say, you have to deliver this by a certain date. And then I always come across. But given no deadline, there's a million things to do (laughs) first before I get to that. My process tends to be that I take myself out of my house with the express goal to write songs. And I'll stay for a week or two weeks or three weeks. I take my cue from Elizabeth Gilbert, talks about creativity, says, show up and it will come. And it's no more complicated than that. So I tell myself that regularly. Tell us about Mike McGee. Mike McGee didn't have a name in my life for 40 years, but he was my son that I gave up for adoption when I was 16. And I posted something on a reunion website, and the next day I was talking to him on the phone. And he was not looking for me for the same reason that I didn't look for him all those years. There's a lot of fear and trepidation involved that you might open a door that you can't close, that you want to close, or you know, just the fear of the unknown. But from the first three minutes of the conversation, I knew that this was going to be a lifelong relationship and that I was so thrilled to find him. He lives in Eugene, Oregon. He's got a family, a fantastic wife, Anne, and a a daughter, Abigail. And the main question for me was always, what kind of a path is this person leaving behind him? And to find out what an exceptional human being he is uh, was just beyond anything I could have expected. And, And he and Julia are very, very close. And it's been a pretty amazing experience. Did that time in your life inspire you musically, and do you have any advice for others? I had already written a song called Mysterious Child about him and assumed that it would never be heard by anyone because it was so personal, but Claire Lawrence, who was producing me, knew that the songs that spilled out while I was trying to write for radio were really the important music that I was writing. So I had already shared that story and only had good things come of it. So I did write an update to it called By the Grace of Goodbye. And as a result of that, so many people have shared their stories. They're all very different, and a lot of them do not have happy outcomes, often because the women have kept the secret their entire lives, and they cannot bear to have it be exposed in any way, which is so sad. My advice is that regardless of who you find, it's worth the effort, and that we should not carry these as shameful secrets because it's not it's life Baby boy to an 
another's hungry arms He came so precious and disarming A family was born with that little baby boy The mother said, I wish the best for the one who changed the rest of us By the grace of her goodbye And every year on that day in December She knew somewhere out there Another mother was thinking of him And be wondering Was he happy? That he was and so loved oh. Forty years went by And on a warm day in July Something tall she should find him That it was time It was time Those three words Yes, it's me And it is of mystery Open hearts and families It was time It was time Brothers, sisters, daughters, wives A mother's wish A father's pride A miracle of fate and time all the threads of our lives Oh, to the grace of that goodbye All by the grace of a goodbye How do you feel about retirement? I don't actually plan on retiring. I love doing this so much, and I'm not done. I feel like I've really just gotten started, and I've always felt that way. Thanks to Sherry Ulrich for joining us on this edition of Today in BC. We would like to hear from you. Send us a voice message with comments and suggestions. You'll find our contact information on our website, todayinbc.com, or our Facebook page, Today in BC. You'll find our podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, and Google Podcasts. 